one Sunday morning, I was in there, and then, and Bobby, first thing Bobby said to me, he said, I met the, I meet the press this morning, I'm, I'm just tied up with this Mississippi thing, will you go on and do it for me, I'll tell them. So I did. And I came back and I had some work to do, and about one o'clock, 1.30, I went into his office and said, uh, so I'm going home now. Anything you want me to do? And he said, you got anything important on this afternoon? I said, no. He said, would you mind going down to Mississippi and taking charge of the thing down there? He said, we don't have any senior official down there. And he said, I think if things go wrong, we'll be heavily criticized if we don't have somebody down there who's senior. Then I can't go. Uh, he couldn't go. I mean, he would have started a riot just by being there. So I said, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll go. He said, I'll get a plane and take you. About then, my assistant, Harold Reese, stuck his head in the door. Bobby said, oh, Harold, he said, you got anything important on this afternoon? <laughs> and Harold said, no, and Bobby said, well, how about you going with Nick down to Mississippi? So we did. We got a plane and went down there, and uh, it was a very, it was a, I don't know, I don't really know what we could have done. I've always thought it was a failure. But it was mostly, uh, at least I like to blame it on the university more than I do on anything else. I mean, we were down there. It became obvious as the kids were coming back. We had Colonel Birdsong and the Highway Patrol was there. and It was obvious we had all these marshals with their helmets on and tear gas and so forth and big armbands. It was obvious that they were very annoying to the, to the kids, and even early on, I asked the university, can we use the gymnasium so I can put away these 300 marshals or 400 marshals, whatever I had. The university said no. I had no place to put them. Uh, we were in the Athenaeum building, which was a sacred building to them in the old Miss. And by the grove there, and uh, it probably was the most irritating place we could have picked, but I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything about Ole Miss. I don't think anybody did. And then we had the developments, and Colonel Birdson decided to pull out, and kids were throwing rocks and taunts and so forth and so on, and they got built up, and then the let the marshals use tear gas. It was getting pretty bad. The situation in Oxford was becoming very tense as hundreds of people streamed into the area to defend Old Miss and the Southern way of life. We have had reports throughout, uh, not merely the students, but of all kinds of people pouring in in cars in order to prevent Meredith from being admitted to, to Ole Miss. Uh, one has to remember also that that was the squirrel hunting season in Mississippi, so there were literally hundreds, thousands of guns. Every pickup truck had a couple of guns in it, uh, and uh, so the, the situation was, was really very dangerous. The next day, Sunday, September 30th, Finally, President Kennedy decided the time had come to enroll James Meredith at Ole Miss. And all the world are upon you and upon all of us. The marshals were ordered not to use guns against the rioters, who were shooting and throwing Molotov cocktails. And the rioters were targeting the media, smashing cameras and attacking reporters. So then we had the military come in. They had enough troops come in down there to Oxford, Mississippi, they could have kept right on going, taking Cuba. Was there any moment of physical danger for yourself? I suppose there must have been. I don't know. I wasn't particularly conscious of it. Uh, it was all kind of funny. I mean, I, we, we had a radio communication set up, which we had planned on in case there was problems to control the marshals. And the radio, the big radio, was set up in the basement of the courthouse. And then we had uh, another set, which was set up in the Athenaeum building, 
smaller, and then we had walkie-talkies. So we had communication throughout the area. Uh, and uh, we used that to know what was going on, to get permission to use tear gas and so forth. I put a dime in a payphone, it was only a dime then, and called the White House Collect and got the President and Bobby on the phone and maintained that throughout the whole time. It was, a, it was quite funny, really. It was an open line? With open line the whole time. The payphone collect. From payphone collect to, to the White House, yep. <laughs> and it's, and so we That's knew what. Story. Chairman of MCI talking about this. We knew what was going on. They didn't. Right. And the Army didn't. And of course, this made a lot of problems in the Army. President Kennedy would say to the Army, where are the troops? And the Army would say they're just now landing at Oxford, the airport there. And he would call me and say, are the troops there? And I'd call the guy at the airport on the walkie-talkie. He'd say, hey, no troops around here. <laughs> so we'd go back. The President was just furious at the Army. And it really wasn't their fault. They had no communications at all. And they had misunderstood some of the instructions badly. I don't know how, I don't know, but we had told them we didn't want loaded guns because if they had to be used, we wanted to come in without loaded guns because of fear that we thought we could control the marshals, but we didn't know about the army. But they had interpreted that as having no guns at all. So they were all standing around ready to go, but they had no guns. so they had to find guns for all, for all the army and so forth. The deployment of federal troops was exactly what Kennedy had wanted to avoid. The next day, Governor Barnett called the White House with an alternate plan. I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. President. Yeah. I'll go up there myself. Well, now, how long will it take you to get there? And I'll get uh, a microphone and tell them that uh, you have agreed to, to, to be removed. No, no, now, wait a minute. How long is, wait a minute, Governor. Now, how long is it going to take you to get up there? About an hour. Now, I tell you, if you want to go up there, you, then you call me from up there, and then we'll decide what we're going to do before you make any speeches about it. This man has just died. Did he die? Yes. Which one? State police? That's uh, state police. Yeah. Well, you see, we got to get order up there, and that's what we thought we were going to have. President, please, why don't you, uh, can't you give an order of prayer to remove me? How can I remove him, Governor, when there's a, a riot in the street, and he may step out of that building and something happened to him? I can't remove him under those conditions. Well, we've got to get somebody up there now to get order and stop the firing and the shooting. And then you and I will talk about what's the best thing to do with Merida. While the President and the Governor argued, the riot worsened. Finally, Katzenbach asked the White House for troops. It took hours for them to arrive, and during the night, 35 marshals were shot, and two people, a French journalist and an Oxford worker, were killed. But by dawn, the army had restored order. Of course the president's gonna win in the end. He's got the whole armed forces of the United States. He can call in the Air Force, he can bring Navy ships up the Mississippi River. He can call out the army as he did. He can drop parachuters in. I suppose he could shoot missiles at Oxford, Mississippi. So he's gonna win at the end. And uh, later, uh, James Meredith and came to my private office and I accommodated the registration there. It wasn't a, a cause for laughter and champagne. Uh, but it was a cause uh, for, for some relief, and, and it, it was the fact that that was over with. I mean, in a way, Oxford had become the symbol of massive resistance and the final gasp of the Civil War, if you want to look at it that way. And it was over. It had ended. It was a lonely victory for James Meredith, but it was a victory for him and the country. The Constitution had held and been reaffirmed in a major crisis. Thousands of black people felt the victory and saw James Meredith as an example to follow, a symbol like the Little Rock Nine of their own power.